So you can't judge students anymore. You, well, yes and no. Will I mean, you know, if I get to have some time with people, but it's best not to make a snap judgment. And I remember Gurren Asano from time to time telling a story of when he was in the army. And I, was it the, was it, I think it was the, 80, the, the 81st Airborne, 80, 82nd Airborne, a very high, highly regarded uh, unit. He was there and he says, there were guys who were real tigers in the boxing ring, but then when it got out to crawling under barbed wire while live rounds were going underhead, that they were Pussy rather cats. timid. And so different people can be, people can be brave in one thing and not so brave in another thing. And it could be a real mistake to confuse the two. And people are motivated by different things. Um, if someone is uh, very motivated by hierarchy, uh, if I may be a bit colorful here, sure. um, you know, some version of my penis is bigger than your penis, you know, these kind of motivations. Um, another guy who's not as motivated by that can uh, back off when pushed by the guy who's seeking dominance. But then there's something could come up where there's a problem and the hierarchy conscious person could go, oh, I don't know, I don't want to get involved. And this seemingly timid guy, just without thinking, surges forward and does the right thing. We so, you know, it, it, it's, I, I think the actual answer can be pretty nuanced. Absolutely. I mean, wouldn't you say that even stick fighters who grapple mm -hmm. is a completely different niche culture compared to MMA fighters? Mm -hmm. And what have you seen that is different in the brain? Well, for several years, we would, uh, after we held the gatherings here at this park, uh, we held the gatherings for a number of years at uh, Rico Ciparelli's uh, Raw Gym up in El Segundo. And for those who don't know the name, Rico Ciparelli was a prodigy of uh, Dan Gable in wrestling. He's two-time world wrestling champion. And he and his good friend uh, Frank Trigg and Vladimir Matushenko, Vlad Vladdy being a former Russian champion, wrestling champion, and Frank Trigg uh, challenged, I think, three times for the UFC middleweight title in a very close matches with uh, close fights with uh, Matt Hughes. You know, and you know, it, it's got to be real close if they think it's worth sh you know going back a second time and right. a third time. And uh, a young Leota Machida was there. Uh, Walid Ishmael was there sometimes. You know, very high level gym. And um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are other names that if I were to put myself to it, I would I, I would remember. And so I was working on my uh, MMA there. Uh, I, that's when I began developing the Kali Tudo system. And we hosted our gatherings there and some you know i'm talking about high level pro mma fighters and we had their respect and you know uh you know, you know frank was always very good to me i know his persona as a fighter was to be the frank anus. trigg yeah and to be an anus i mean you know that was just part of it. It, sometimes it's marketing it's a business and, you know, so he would be a smack talker, you know, in, in terms of promoting fights. But with me, he was always, you know, very much a gentleman, you know, helping me. And, you know, there I was already in my early 50s. So as an athlete, I posed no challenging questions for them. You know, they would back off and adjust to my level of physicality. But um, you, know, you guys are crazy. You know, I'd start waving sticks around and you'd get away from me with that stick. It is all ban huge gym banter you know but you know i think we had genuine respect uh, you know, a lot of the mma guys just you guys have got to be crazy you know there's no way we would do that and then there would be other guys who would be well i would just do a double leg takedown yeah okay. okay okay and you don't appreciate that the puño could cave in your head once i throw guard you know from your double leg you know, anyway um you know, so again, it returns to the you know the point I made a moment ago about people are brave in different ways, and it's just best to be humble. Now, for the listening and viewing audience, uh, you know, people are more familiar with the term valetudo. Mm -hmm. So, if you could, if you don't mind expounding on valetudo okay. and yeah, so for those who aren't familiar with valetudo, uh, it, it roughly the, the etymology is uh, from the Latin words that in English would come out as valid total, 
which more normally speaking more normally translates as anything goes everything is valid and uh basically that was the rules under which the early ufc which the ufc began and it's pronounced vale tudo portuguese and spanish being similar in this respect and i speak spanish uh, but most, a lot of Americans will pronounce the V-A-L-E of Vale. They will pronounce it Vali. You know, by American English rules, that's a natural thing to do. And so it made for my idea of a, a, a funny, bad pun to say Kali Tudo. And in the Kali Tudo subsystem, what I'm looking to develop is to use the MMA experience as an adrenal laboratory for... Uh, making real Kali's promise that the movements of the empty hand are like the movements of the weapons. Now for the listening and watching viewer, the adrenal state is the actual state when you take part of the actual fight. Well, the adrenal the state ad is when the adrenaline kicks in. And, and, and the way human, you know, in other words, real fight time. Correct. As, as versus what sometimes we playfully call martial arts and crafts. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm going to have to use that. And, um, you know, martial arts and crafts is wonderful. And it's possible to have a good time and good exercise and so forth. But, and where I differ from some people who mock traditional martial arts is I think that there's a tremendous amount of wisdom to be found there. But a lot of people don't see that because many of the people who train martial arts, martial arts and crafts, don't do so with the fighter's understanding. There's no understanding of what the adrenal realities are, what happens to performance, how you actually perceive and experience what you're doing and things you think you can do when someone's just kind of standing in front of you and not genuinely coming after you. you maybe you don't do so much when things get wild and crazy. And... Um, but I think if you bring the fighter's understanding to that training, there's tremendous value to be held. I remember I did an interview many years ago. Let's see, it would be 1988. I, because, I know because of something. Uh, I did an interview with uh, Grandmaster Leo Haran of Largamano Arnis in his basement where he did a lot of training. And um, for those of you not familiar with the name, this is a man who... Um, was uh, an Afilip American Filipino in California who signed up, a Filipino, in, not American Filipino, but a Filipino who was in America uh, when World War II began, and he wound up being uh, a, a scout for a, a small team that went back into the Philippines to radio back to General MacArthur down in Australia about the Japanese uh, troop movements and conditions and so forth, and while they were at it, to harass the enemy. And so this is a man who has been in many close quarter life and death, um, uh, close quarter combats in the jungles, you know, during night, during daytime. And he can tell you, you know, what they would do is they would have a three man formation. The triangle formation. The triangle formation, the best man being the point of the triangle. And the lead man would have him, his big bolo. Uh, in his hand, I showed him my father's machete from World War II when he was in New Guinea. My father was a CB in the Navy. He says, yes, this is the size we would use, and it's a monster machete. And they would have their their sidearm in their other hand so that they didn't want to fire because they didn't want to give away their position, the, the muzzle flash to give away their position, especially at night. And so when the Japanese were sent to come charging through the jungle to find them, the lead man would inflict damage on the charging soldier picture you know a japanese soldier with his rifle and the very long bayonet and then pass the wounded man off to either the left or right to be finished off by one of the other corners of the triangle while he then dealt with the next attack or you know the, the way they would run through past the japanese guy and there would be a movement that you would cut the femoral motion femoral artery as you were from behind as you went on to the next man in a very different kind of fighting and so this is a man who clearly is entitled to his opinions Correct. on how to train and it, and one of the things he the points he made was you didn't want to have your training leave you dinged up for when you went out on patrol so the drills that were designed to keep skills sharp with a bolo, with a machete, what we would call or what they would call their bolo, you didn't want to have 
accidentally take a, you know, a, a stick shot to your trigger finger or, you know, or, or something like that. Um, you know, so the skills, the drills were someone today my, uh, of a certain mindset on ah, martial arts and crafts. It's like, but they brought the fighter's understanding to what the drill was. And if I may put in a moment of advertising, on our DVD, The Grandfather Speak, there's a 28-minute minute minute documentary which uh, our editor, Ron Gabriel, did a magnificent job of. And Ron's in the Screamador, and he's Filipino. And so he really put a lot of passion into this piece of taking this interview I did with Grandmaster Haran and finding very rare footage and Guru Asano gave me some footage of the Filipino Bolo Battalion's training and you see what they do huh it kind of looks like Sombrata and you know so I don't think anybody today who mocks the Sombrata training would want to be in front of one of these men and tell them that they were clueless now let me ask you uh, the Filipino culture is still an undiscovered undiscovered culture absolutely you know it's still decades away from being put on the map so they say uh-huh. in tv it can be very secretive absolutely and this is not appreciated by the broader culture here do you think a lot of what you have also on youtube where you blur out particular techniques is that something you picked up from the filipino culture or is that mark denny new yorker i'm also a lawyer ism <laughs> Well, actually, I think some of that is uh, trying to get people to buy the DVD. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, there it is. But there are also certain things I don't put on DVD. I mean, for example, in my anti-knife material, the, the, the dog catcher and the collie fence and the related material there, I show, actually, I have Dogzilla demonstrate, you know, the attack that the, we call the prison sewing machine. And Dogzilla is a federal corrections officer um, who is also leads the special events team squad that we might call it. You know, so he knows very much. And he also he was a he was a cook in the Marines. He said their battle cry was death from within. But he's also the the cook for federal prison. He, he uh, he's now out in Hawaii at the federal prison there. And so every day at work, he's in an intensely weapon rich environment surrounded by people who are studying his patterns, studying what he does. And as he once said to me, he says, if a riot goes down, they're all going to be coming after me at once, picking up what's laying around the kitchen. And, you know, picture the things that could be laying around an institutional kitchen. And um, Kali is what's going to get me through a room full of men and out the door when they're trying to kill me and or make me pregnant. And... It's, uh, how did I get on this? I'm sorry. I, well, I was just uh, asking you how... You... Oh, oh the, I'm, I'm sorry. So, yeah, so he demonstrated the um, the prison sewing machine. So when he demonstrates it, there's a real... He's seen it. I mean, he's seen it used to kill people. And I think it's important for good people to understand that primal ferocity. It's primitive. It's basically high five and low five. You know, push, you know, you know boom, it's prison sewing machine. So I don't think I'm letting any tricks out of the bag when I let that be seen by the general public. But there's certainly there's other things I do know which are much trickier and nastier, but I don't want to diffuse that knowledge out there. You know, so the fact that there are people who are into a certain stage of uh, development in their consciousness where it's, look at me, look at me, and they, they, they put things out there for anybody and the knife calls to the dark. And I remember with, um, in my training with Punagur Edgar Salite, he told me about a training, uh, it was a mental psychological training that he entered into uh, for a time. And he was woken up at night and he popped out of bed with the knife in his hand. And he realized that he, because of this training, he could hurt his family. It was awakening too much accidentally because it it was awakening the dark too much the blade is very dark and I don't want to further that and so I limit myself in what I put out and say well this is what a prison sewing machine is anybody the thug culture everybody knows that indeed an untrained person who's not part of the thug culture will tend to instinctively do prison sewing machine and in the logic of Dog Brother Martial Arts, the way I construct it is, I like to say, primal probabilities first. 
If you can't handle the primal probability, you don't get to the more evolved stuff. Same, you know, with stick fighting, if you can't handle a powerful caveman, you don't get to the rest of it. And so in the knife fighting, I don't teach, you know, there's, when I work with the military or, you know, certain kinds of, you know, or, you know law enforcement units where they might be having to use the knife. Um, you know, for example, I, wor I, I work regularly with uh, Customs and Border Patrol at their advanced training center. And the kind of work they do is really quite complex and dangerous. Picture you're part of a team of two to four people. You're 50 miles from away from the nearest help. You're along the Mexican border, and you got three basic categories of problems. One, you got to arrest somewhere between 20 and 40 people, most of whom are he coming here to be dishwashers, nannies, you know. Anything uh, to survive outside of your yeah, 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 country. Yeah, yeah. I, and I have a lot of love for Mexico. I've lived down there and, and, and so forth, and, you know, just people come in, in search of economic survival. I understand that. doesn't mean they should be allowed in, but I have no rancor towards that. Uh, the second pro category of problem is it's a, it's a, it's a pack of uh, drug mules. You know, they're, they're carrying the drugs and they're getting across, and they may very well be armed. They may be disposed to fight, or may, they may be disposed to just drop the drugs and run, and then, you know, you know sort of a, it, it, there's still a fair amount of uh, catch and release quality to how they're treated. And then the third category of problem they might run into is uh, a rip gang which is a gang from a competing narco unit, you know, yard, narco cartel looking to rip off the drug shipment of another one. And they may very, you know, they're probably heavily armed and heavily trained. You know, you're looking at full on firefight. And so as you approach a group of people, you don't know which of those three, they don't know which of the three categories they're dealing with. It's all poker. Yeah. And so if they're trying to arrest, um, you know, 20 to 30 people, the, the two of the four of them are trying to arrest 20 to 30 people, and someone decides to, you know, a couple of them decide to bum rush and ambush, you know, that backup knife, they need to have skills to bring that knife to bear. And so I have a method and a system that I think imparts efficient skills very quickly and effectively that can operate in the adrenal state. But I'm not going to put that out there in the civilian context. If I'm working with a special forces unit, you know, sometimes I work with people who are out of uniform outside of the United States, you know them I'll teach, but I'm not going to put that out there for the civilian world. And so in that, I like to, you know, my, I feel that I'm trying to uh, do my part in carrying on the values with which I was taught. All of my teachers have been Filipino. I'm a white American, but all of my teachers have been Filipino. Well, you know, when in the traditional sense of learning knife, they like you to learn how to be offensive with it, so that way you can learn to be defensive with it. Understood, is, and that's why I show the and that? that's why I show the prison sewing machine, but they also are careful about to whom they teach it. Tons yeah. of screening, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I'm in a somewhat different position because I'm teaching very publicly. You know, I have my private students, and you know them with them. You know, the, the, that's different. But if I'm putting out a DVD, if I'm doing a seminar. Uh, if I'm meeting somebody that I, you know, if I'm working with somebody that I don't know pretty well, um, somebody can seem pretty normal, but there can be cracks in their psyche, and it's like a hammer tapping on a brick. You don't necessarily see the crack that's there, and then all of a sudden the brick breaks in two. And a lot of people come to martial arts to heal something within their spirit. And so you don't want to turn them down and say, oh, I, I, you know, I sense a crack in your spirit. You know, it's like, well, as a teacher, you want to be able to help that person heal their spirit. But maybe it's not, that's not the person, certainly at this point, to say, and here's how you efficiently kill with a knife. Right. You know, you know, I had somebody say to me once, well, anybody can buy a gun. But... You know, you go to the gun range, you shoot the paper target, you know, da-da-da-da. There's other ways of training with a gun, too. But I don't think it calls to the dark quite as much. There, there's something very visceral about a knife, and people that I know who have used a, a knife to, uh, to kill, they talk about feeling the person's life pass out of them and into the knife and into you and they say it's a uh, it's a strange word but they say it's an incredibly intimate experience 
and to be viscerally preparing oneself for that the if there's flaws in the personality if there's flaws in judgment if someone's still working out their young male ritual hierarchical issues and all of a sudden something happens there was a case in new york uh many years ago uh, sometimes known as the umali case and in the telling of the story there's different versions of it how rare but uh, I, I think I can be safely say uh, that in essence there was a disagreement between this w- one group of uh, uh, guys and the security that the, the New York law just said no smoking in bars new law and they just told security to buzz off and so security sent over this guy named Tiny who of course was 6'5 and 350 and uh, According to whose version you believe, Tiny may or may not have been administering some justice outside or what he perceived as justice. And so Umali went, you can't do that to my friend. And he comes up, comes up and, he, and he had been training only nine months, I think, but he uh, knew a technique called the C-cut. And he did a C-cut to the inside of Tiny's leg. And many hours later and many quarts of infusions of blood later, Tiny was dead on the operating table at Bellevue Hospital. Now, Umali was a guy. He had a job. He was going to school. He, was, he had a fiancé. Um, you know, somebody seemingly, you know, on a good trajectory in life, but in this one moment of excited, I'm going to help my friend. I mean, that, that's not malicious. And look at the size of that big guy. I mean, you know, you know it was, but in that moment, he exercised poor judgment made a big mistake and i don't know if he's out of prison yet um and so knife is a tricky thing now a lot of new york now is hipsterisms pop-up shops cupcake stores Uh and a lot of people forget that new york at that time in in the 70s and even up to the 80s it was it was like a war zone at certain particular times Uh, yeah you're talking about my youth and you have spoken on, on on several videos that you know you would take the train yeah to, the subway to the, yeah the subway what were experiences like that were during your youth that wouldn't be comparable now everyone's in an ipod and they're listening to their music and itunes so my god you do that but you do act like that in those days and you know you're the, the, the gazelle who's going to get picked off at the edge of the herd but um I think I was, I think it was 1962, which would make me 11 or, you know, 10 or 11 years old, maybe 63. There was a case that was very famous at the time, and if you were to Google it, you would find it. Uh, a woman by the name of Kitty Genovese was killed. And what brought notoriety to the case was she was brutalized in the street for probably about an hour and, uh, you know, raped and brutalized and eventually killed as she screamed for help for over an hour and what all people did was they turned up their TV so they didn't have to listen they closed their windows and they left her on her own out there nobody came forward and on some very profound level that deeply deeply offended me and I had various incidents of my own you know shooting off rockets in the park oh here come nine tough looking kids my two friends ran away these kids, you know, they smash my rocket or I'm riding bicycle with a friend and these three tough kids, um, you know, they grabbed me and my bicycle. My friend rode off. They smash my bicycle. Now, you know, th- this isn't a big deal, but, it's, you know, just it gives you a sense of things as you go around the world. And as you start getting out and about on your own at night, you know, as you hit your teenage years and and, and further, uh, oh, there's three junkies over there. And maybe that, you know, they're looking to make their last score of the night, you know, so that they can go out, and, you know, go and buy the drugs they want to buy. And so, you know, in the same way that you come to the watering hole, as you know, as a zebra or something, and like, there's the lions over there. Okay, there's the male lions trying to distract me in front. That means the female lions must be behind. You know, I think I'm going to position myself on this side of the herd. Or you know, And so the same thing with the, you know, the subway cars. You know, say, okay, I'm going to be getting off at such and such street. At that stop, the stairs are at the, nor- the, the front end of where the train stops, whereas at the, the, the platform where, the, where I am now, 
the stairs are at what will be the rear end of the train. So as I get on the train at the rear, you know, I want to stay near the stairs. So in case there's a problem, I, you know, here's the stairs here. Am I going to get cut off if I'm there? Uh, now I'm on the train, so I move from the rear car to the front car. So when I get out the front, you know, the front car, I'm nearer to the stairs. Or, you know, you, you start thinking very tactically, and um, so I think a lot of people who go into martial arts do so for reasons of young male ritual, hierarchical nature. The, you know, as I said, your penis is bigger than my penis. The bully kicks sand in my face, kind of things. And I'm thinking more in terms of yeah, I remember those three guys who were, you know, chasing me down 93rd Street that night. And, you know, and, and um, if they had caught up with me, how would I deal with that? And uh, and did you have training then already? I did not. Oh, okay. Okay, but, you know, I was young and agile. and uh, But I, I think, and I think I know the uh, thing that tipped me over the line in terms of, you know, I really need to get involved with training was... Um, between college and, and law school, I had an open semester because I graduated from college in a December. And so I enrolled in a Mexican law school. I took just two courses, but I wanted to get my Spanish from decent tourist into an adult level. And after the semester was over, a friend of mine and I jumped in this car that I'd brought down with me as a, uh, a Chevy with an inline six that the left side had been smashed up by the police in Philadelphia during a hot pursuit and it didn't meet inspection criteria and the family that owned it was moving back to Israel and so I bought it from them for $75. Wow. So, so we jumped in this $75 Chevy out of Mexico City. I don't know if you know the geography of Mexico and so we went east over to the Gulf of Mexico and then there and then from there we, we dropped south and we came into Chiapas from the north side, the rainforest of Palenque and then as we continued south we went up into the mountains about 3,000 foot altitude. There's a town called San Cristobal de las Casas. So we're at this point, we're very close to the Guatemalan border, and this is a very Indian region of Mexico. And um, there were these two girls uh, in the restaurant as I was getting breakfast, and they were struggling with their Spanish. And, and uh, you know, uh, they're sort of blonde, hippie chick types. And one of them is asking for huevos y jabón, which is eggs and soap. She wanted to say huevos y jamón, meaning eggs and ham, ham right. and eggs. And so I gallantly helped her out, and the cute meat accomplished. You know, Luis came, and we wound up, we went out horseback riding for the day. And uh, uh, wonderful day as we're, you know, these horses as we're riding in the, you know, the, the, the forest of 3,000 feet, you know, so, and this and that. And... Uh, very low population density area. They took off their shirts, and you know, Luis and I were in trances. They bounced along, and uh, we got um, back to the village that evening. In the village, you know, San Cristobal is uh, I don't know, maybe town, a, a town, uh, and it's a part of Mexico where most people Spanish is the second language. Okay. There's various Indian languages up in the mountains. You know, you might have 20 languages, you know, spread around the mountains there. Maybe 10, I don't know. Uh, and they would, you know, they come into town, and you know, the women would sell the blankets that they had woven, or you know, you know, something like that. And but the way that they, these two blonde girls were dressed, was very inappropriate for the context of that culture. And I said, hey, would you like to change into something different before we go to dinner? Ah, eh, these macho Mexican guys are going to have to learn. You know, we're liberated American women. And so we didn't say anything because we were hoping to get lucky. Right. And um, here's and, another beer. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and um, and not 90 seconds after this exchange, three locals have been drinking. They're looking in a, in a brown part of the world. Blondes can do a the certain kind of energy. And in this part of the world, women wear skirts that go down to their ankles or feet. And here are these girls in shorts and no bras, and they're blonde. And so, you know, here's these Strange guys. fruit. Well, and provocative fruit. Right, okay. And, uh, I mean, you know, by the, the criteria of that time and place, they're hookers. Right. And um, so the three locals uh, grabbed the girl that was with my buddy and started trying to drag her off. There's three of them and two of us, and they, she's going to go with them. They just figured her for a hooker. And... Um, so I had this belt buckle in my back pocket, and I pulled it out. And Indian blood, I was the biggest guy there by quite a bit. And now I got this, for all practical purpose, brass knuckle in my hand. And so I, met, I threatened them with it, and I got her back. And uh, 
they were kind of hippy dippy and they, they're not really understanding what's going on because it's in Spanish and they didn't really speak Spanish. And uh, so she's standing there with her fingers in a peace sign and she's going, no problemas, no problemas. And so they grabbed her again and a, four, a friend of theirs arrives and now it's uh, four against two and I had to really come after him with the brass knuckles and I got her back and we're backing up the street and they're, they're, they're chasing us but they're afraid to be the first one to step in because I'm big and I got this brass knuckle. Really just a belt buckle but you know, it was perfect. Essentially the same purpose. Yeah, back then the, the, you know, the belts were very wide and so a certain, anyway, uh, so we, we and they break off and saying, vamos al coche, put la pistola. Let's go to the car and get the pistol. And it's like, oh, shit. And the girls don't understand. They're getting a gun. And so we run to the town square, the Zocalo, because that's always where the police station is. And there's this cop on duty. And we run up. There are these guys after us, and they have a gun. And so they, the, the four guys come roaring up in a Volkswagen bug, uh, bug. And the cop was only a transit cop, so he doesn't have a gun. All he's got is a screwdriver. The reason he has a screwdriver is the way they enforced fines at that time and place was he would remove the license plate and wait for the person to come back and then sell them back their license plate. Interesting. So, well, if you don't have a central computer system and no one's, you know, what, what you're going to do? You know, you know, you know, simple, practical, efficient. So he ran away thinking they had a gun. They, in point of fact, they didn't. They had Coke bottles and car antennas. And so we had this wild ass fight in front of the police station. And... Um, the girls and Luis and I wound up barricading ourselves in the empty police station, which was, I don't know, not very big, maybe 15 by 15. And these guys are trying to bang down the door. I got my foot and shoulder up against the door, and the girls are, the girls are screaming, call for help, call for help. And I'm, where? We're already in the police station. <laughs> right. Nowhere to go. And there's a bunch of stuff that happens there. And make a long story, and I think I'm using story short, we wind up climbing out the back window as the police arrive and force to see us climbing out the back window of the police station. And so we get arrested, and Luis and I get thrown in, not jail, but the state prison for three days. And, and we had adventures there. Um, Maybe get an inkling of some of those adventures in a little bit? Uh, you could share? It would, it